Welcome to the Algorithmic Advantage. We're here to expand the toolkit of the quant trading community and introduce investors to the many advantages of systematic trading. Our goal is to educate and inspire as we embark on a captivating journey into the vast knowledge and experience of leading portfolio managers and other experts in the field. We hope you enjoy the show. And if you do, please subscribe, leave us a review, or even buy us a coffee via the link on the algorithmicadvantage.com. We really appreciate it. Financial markets are in a perpetual state of flux, constantly evolving with changes in technology, shifts in regulatory landscapes, and the dynamic entry and exit of market players. All the while, business cycles ebb and flow. In the face of such uncertainty, how do we navigate these turbulent waters? How can we effectively process the barrage of information available? Does the conventional wisdom of buy and hold withstand scrutiny when faced with substantial drawdowns of 50% or more? How do we truly maximise returns and minimise drawdowns? Are there secrets to investing hidden in plain sight? Within the intricate tapestry of the market's daily dance, where buyers and sellers engage in the complex choreography of the free market system, noise and confusion abound. Yet amidst this chaos, certain traders and investors have thrived over extended periods. They've capitalised on discerning patterns amidst the clamour, leveraging systems and methodologies that exploit fundamental, enduring human behaviours such as fear, greed and the propensity to follow the crowd and follow trends. There are some time-tested quantitative processes that were refined by the legendary Chicago traders Rich Dennis and Bill Eckhart, and they passed these skills on to a group of budding naive traders in the 1980s. These traders became known as the Turtles. With us today is one of those trainees who now has a track record that extends many decades and a new breed of adherence to these principles. Enter the modern day turtles that adhere to a classic trend following approach. How do they navigate the markets and what adaptations have they made? What principles guide their actions? Well, what better way to unravel these mysteries than to spend a few days in Sydney with them, which is exactly what we've done. And here we are on beautiful Pittwater Harbour at the offices of East Coast Capital Management on Scotland Island, talking classic trend following around the barbie with the legends of the game. Welcome, ladies and gents, to beautiful Pittwater Harbour. We are on um, Scotland Island, the offices of Adam at ECCM. Adam, thanks. Welcome, Adam. We've got Adam from ECCM, the Sydney-based classic trend follower. We have Jerry from Chesapeake, our American contingent. Thanks so much, Jerry. Rich, uh, thanks for joining me once again in this beautiful spot. Thanks, Simon. The M&M's, Moritz and Moritz from Takahei Capital come all the way from Germany, our European classic trend followers. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Simon. We're looking forward to speaking about systematic trend following and classic trend following, something very unique that these guys represent and we're super happy to have them talking about it in this beautiful location where we're having a drink and a barbecue and relaxing and enjoying uh, the beautiful spot that we're in. And uh, we couldn't resist having a conversation about trading first up. So uh, that's what we love to do. As we know, Rich, Australia is the new headquarters of yes. quant trading. and Trend central. Trend central. <laughs> What's trending on Sydney Harbour? Yes. That's what we can call it trending on Sydney Harbour. And I thought um, good to bring investors along on the journey a little bit as well and um, start with very briefly, I might ask you, Moritz, why systematic? And we can go from there into why trend following and ultimately why classic trend following. So yeah, Moritz, um, I think from an investor perspective, 
there's a there's a need, particularly in Australia, to be a little more educated about why systematic in general, right? Why not discretionary? The rules allow me to backtest strategies, find out if they work over time, if they're resilient and robust. I've just never had any success with discretionary trading. I think um, if you want to give money to anybody trading in a discretionary way, definitely don't give me the money. Mm. I'd be doing a very, very poor job with it. Um, when I was younger or started, you know, that's how I tried doing it, buying mutual funds, um, trying to figure things out. Stuff was kind of like fancy in the news and uh, you just buy what people like follow tips and all these type of things. That lost me a lot of money. There's just nothing there. And um, I like working with data, like working with these rules, researching these systems. And then they are kind of like the guiding light. You follow these rules and um, that's a solid trading approach. You do it over and over and over again on many different markets. Um, you get to trade more markets. You, you can handle more markets, markets, more data. The computer does all the heavy lifting. The computer does the work. It's wonderful. Mm. Um, gives me a lot of free time to actually think about these systems. And um, I don't have to make stuff up. And then the other thing is predicting is, I would say, almost impossible. Like people try to predict and you know create forecasts. It is just in this world where everything happens sometimes all at once. Um, I don't think that you can really predict anything. I mean, it's been shown over and over again that, you know, people think something's going to happen, whatever, tomorrow in a month time, and then it's, you know, something different happens. So I just, I'm very peaceful and happy with not having to predict anything. Mm. Um, just uh, do what, what comes along. Is it fair to say then that you actually think it is the best approach to being able to beat the market because predicting is so inherently dangerous it's dangerous i guess there's probably other ways to beat the market and we don't beat the market whatever you define as the market all the time i mean there's periods where we underperform and don't beat the market but mm. i'd uh, i'd reckon and you know wager a guess that over a longer period of time longer time frames we should be able to be ahead we'll make that money and by the way we'll also have a much smaller risk of losing a lot of money and uh, destroying our portfolios, which happens to, unfortunately, a lot of investors because they over leverage, they become overconfident, they, you know, stick to the losing trades in a hope of these losing trades to, you know, come back and, you know, make back their money and turn into winners. And, and that's just um, statistically the wrong approach. You need to kill these losers and weed them out, keep them very small and let the winners take care of so themselves. So you've got a statistical statistically validated reason for doing what you're doing as well. That is what the data shows. I mean, we have, you know, thousands of data points, sample size, and um, that's our trade statistics. We have more losing trades than winning trades. Um, we know what our average loss, our average winner is, you know, likely going to be. Not every trade is obviously the same, but based on that statistical evidence that we've got mm. we trade and we continue to trade and mm. um that's just absolutely great Jer jerry um over to you i remember you saying um when rich dennis was talking to you you actually said that systematic is more important than trend following so what's that about and explain that rationale I think when um, you know when we were trading for Rich and learning under Rich and Bill, we definitely were taught trend following, systematic trend following, um, replace your emotions with objectivity, and I took that to mean uh, they were they were uh, hardcore trend followers, and I think I ended up believing now that they were hardcore systematic traders. So I was the one who thought trend following was the greatest thing ever, uh, systematic trend, but. They were willing to more change into other short-term strategies, anything as long as it was rules-based, back-testable. Yep. Um, they probably still think uh, diversification is really important, taking small losses. But um, I think they probably wrote off trend following. Once you had to go out so far when you look back period and have these big drawdowns, I was fine with me. I just wanted to continue to trend follow. For them, they probably said, no, that, that's, it's off the table now. 
we're going to do shorter term trading. Um, and so I became, I was more of a trend follower than they probably were. That was my bottom line. Their bottom line was successful, systematic, rules-based trading. So it's just a minor, sort of a minor comment, really. So if Rich and Bill were here, they'd be saying um, you were, what we're applying today is what they wanted back, back in those times, or is it more what you have changed a bit and now you are more trend focused than systematic? No, I'm 100% systematic and 100% trend focused. Yep. Uh, just being so long term is probably something that they would not find appealing. Yeah, it's that's pretty much it. And so, like I've often said that um, I haven't really changed our strategy very much, except the look back <clears throat> from 20 days, you know, the 20 day high to the 100 day high and beyond. Uh, and they may say, oh, then that's not even close to what we do. You can say you haven't changed very much, <clears throat> but, but that, very, that very fact that you have such a long holding period and you're willing to give back a tremendous amount of this open orange juice profit then we just we don't agree you're not that similar to us but that's all I've, I've kept all the rules and everything's pretty much the same except the look back and then I added stocks and uh, uh, <clears throat> we'll what? ask you about that yeah yeah Adam systematic to you what does it mean uh, well it all starts with a back test I think and uh, and data so it's the quality of the data that goes in and, uh, and the quantum and, um, and, and the length of history that you can get. And I think we probably all have data, I mean, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, for some markets, not everything. Uh, and the more data you have, the better. And then, um, and then the back tests. And, uh, and you can see what works uh, over time, uh, through cycles, inflation, deflation, crisis, uh, bull markets, bear markets, the whole gamut of history. And whilst we can't uh, predict the future, we can effectively be positioned uh, for the uh, unanticipated, um, you know, uh, by, by virtue of having those back tests uh, guide us without necessarily uh, constraining us in the way that we, uh, we put our trades on. So, um, from systematic and into trend following, Jerry, you've your the ticker for your new ETF is TFPN trend following plus nothing. So <clears throat> obviously you're making a statement that um, that you specifically want to be very focused in what you're doing. So what does it mean to you trend following plus nothing and why? Um, <clears throat> means to me, uh, well, we don't need to add anything to the trend following. No counter trend. Nothing to smooth it out. You need to man up and be a big boy and uh, sit with those winning trades and let them run and uh, not <clears throat> put in some negative skew stuff. And um, I think everybody has rules and I think no one probably, very few people are going to uh, not be in favor of rule-based approach, but a lot of people have bad rules. And then I think a lot of people don't follow their rules. So it's having rules and backtesting them is just kind of the beginning. Uh, and we're all about having these robust rules and a few rules. Uh, that's a key too. And this is what classic is all about and trend following plus nothing. Because another way to add something to trend following is to add what I'd consider to be non-trend following ideas like um, not having a stop loss, um, a lot of exiting the trade before the trend reverses. Um, this uh, under some guise of um, low volatility money management risk control which is just old-fashioned way of taking profits because they're too wimpy to hang on and um, <clears throat> and then they blame it on the clients oh my gosh if I hear another person blame this suboptimal trading on clients I'm gonna explode but yeah that's what they do because the clients like it and I'm and I think one good rule is if the clients like it you probably shouldn't do it yeah yeah so they don't know what they're doing. They have the, we have the human emotions and um, desires that go, run counter to all good styles of trading. They have it even times 10. They don't even trade. We kind of know it, we acknowledge it, we fight it, we've learned from it. 
So the last thing I'm going to do is listen to my clients. I don't have a lot of clients to listen to anyways. <laughs> Maritz, um, we, we talk about these simple rules, and some of the simple rules that we profess as the golden rules of trend following is that small bets, um, a stop loss, a single exit. So what that team seems to do is avoid this process of over-optimization. So it therefore means that our strategies are very robust over a range of different um, market regimes. They're not optimized for any particular regime. We have these loose pants. Do you want to talk about how we avoid overfitting with our processes? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, there are, statistically speaking, many ways to avoid overfitting by using statistics to make sure that you don't fall into the assumption that what you see is actually a valid or significant outcome, right? So classical overfitting thing is like people running a lot of back tests, for example, a thousand back tests on the same data set and then taking that sharp ratio for granted. So there are of course statistical ways we can make sure that that doesn't happen. So we can adjust those sharp ratios, for example, that's the easiest thing, divide by the number of back tests you have run them, divide by the number, um, the square root of back tests you have run them, just to make sure you're downward adjusting because you actually have oversampled that sample itself. This is kind of like a very valid statistical approach itself. And for me, the, the beauty in trend following and how we do it is actually that we do not change depending on the markets too much. So we use similar rules, as you said, for every market and increase our sample size yeah. and do not n focus on that very narrow point where we find this local optimum where it's this market with these rules is delivering the best result over the sample we are seeing. So for me, it's the beauty of having this simplified approach, which, which gives us basically our, our confidence in that the systems will work in any regime. So what, what we often do is we make this statement, whenever anyone comes up with a new idea and they put this idea to us, the first thing we say is, what's your sample size? So Maritz, what's your, what's your response to that uh, in relation to um, this, what we talk about, the need for this sample size? Jerry often speaks about it, so I'll get uh, your, your opinion and Jerry's opinion about this need for large sample size, how we simplify um, the, our method of counting, um, you know, with our, you know, which is different to say some of these more um, advanced overlays applied to strategies that make it difficult for us to actually conceive what they mean by sample size with dynamic precision sizing, volatility adjusting. Yeah. So can you explain that from your perspective, this, this desire for sample size? Yeah. Look, Rich, in the bigger scheme of things, um, we don't actually have that much of a sample size. If you really objectively look at it, if you compare this to a shorter term trader, or a high frequent, like a high frequency trading shop probably has the sample size that we do in five minutes. It's like our entire sample size. It's like since for the past 30 years or 40 years is, is what Citadel does in five minutes or maybe two or one, I don't even know, but definitely within a day. So we don't have that much to work with. And, um, you know, as you know, imagine just a scenario where you had a sample size of, let's just say 40 or 50. And some people would say, oh, well, that's actually, you know, quite something. But if you roll a fair dice 40 times, you wouldn't be too surprised to see the number six come up or five come up, you know, 12 times, even though that is not the statistical expectation for the long run. Yeah. So what we need to do or what I like to do is, and we've said this, it's better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. In order to get to a sample size, we need relatively simple but good proven rules. If we used you know, additional filters and an additional parameter and yet another, you know, um, indicator that would get us in or out of a trade. That just destroys sample size, essentially. You know, you're looking back into history on something that has, you're fitting the past to your parameters. Um, it's very unlikely when you do that, that what you've seen in the past and what you've backtested in, in the past historically will replay in that same way or even in a similar way in the future. So you need these, Jerry says it, loose pants. Um, keep your losses small. Let the winners run. That is very important. And just do it over and over and over again. Um, 
don't be obsessed, by the way, with any single trade outcome. This is also very important. This, yeah, we're like sample size, few thousand trades, whatever. But look, I mean, one trade out of all the, you know, thousands that we've seen, you know what? It doesn't really matter that much. I mean, every once in a while it doesn't matter because it's orange juice, but most of the time it's, um, you know, it's one in the books. Let's see what let's see what happens. You know, and usually it's whatever, a small loss, you know, a one hour loss, um, or a flat trade, or a few basis points up. I mean, this is kind of like our, the usual, the usual daily thing that we're working with, right? And, and, and then we have profit give back, um, like, like this week, maybe a little bit. And, um, and every once in a while, just everything shifts and starts moving in the right direction. And we, we make these large gains. But um, I guess we'll come to that. That is also part of the pain and the psychology and all this type of thing. So, mm -hmm. yes, to answer your question more specifically, sample size is important. I'd love to have as much as we can. Oh, by the way, by adding more markets, right? Yeah. Uh, we can actually get more sample size and more statistical evidence for what it is that we do, that we're actually following the right approach, that we are on the right track. Yeah. So the markets that you all trade are important. So briefly, a question for all of you. You keep going then, Moritz. What markets do you trade? Well, we trade um, a diversified range of futures markets at the moment. Um, commodities, currencies, fixed income instruments, so bond futures, equities. Um, we have Bitcoin in the portfolio. We trade lumber. Um, we trade metal markets. Uh, we trade canola and rapeseed and milling wheat and white mace and you know some of the smaller commodity markets which orange juice we've mentioned cocoa um, which aren't in everybody's portfolio and you know what um, Simon would like to trade more markets mm. it's, it's it's a function of um, how we grow our business it's a function of how our AUM will develop in the future the larger our AUM um, the beauties of being on an island is that sometimes yeah. a seaplane comes through. Uh, Can we see the seaplane there? That's uh, like the one you guys arrived in. Yeah. And um, yeah, we would like to trade at some point freight, um, electricity, more currencies. Um, you know, some people trade the Kenyan shilling um, or the Chilean peso. I mean, and why not, right? Or electricity in New Zealand. Um, there's a broker that contacted us just a few weeks back saying, oh, you have to trade South Island electricity futures. I was like, well, maybe at some point, not now, but I'm, I'm absolutely open to the idea. Mm. Um, the more of these markets we can get, the smaller we can actually trade them, we'll have smaller bet sizes on every single one of them. We have additional diversification, and it's, I think it's also better for our investors because we try to get exposure to markets that are really independent to one another and likely to not be in your, your investor's portfolio already. Mm -hmm. They're like on bonds and equities, some currencies, like all the G7, all the liquid stuff. If something happens in the world, odds are these markets will react and start to correlate and they'll have a response to it. But you are much less likely to see that same response, in my example, on South Island, New Zealand mm -hmm. electricity or immediately in the freight markets maybe. And that is where there is a lot of value that allows us to have a uncorrelated different return stream with positive expectancy over time, but uncorrelated at specific point in time no guarantees for that but just there is a a good possibility that we might be a very good counterbalance to investors portfolios and their usual holdings that they have very hard to get anywhere like that exposure from an from an equities portfolio alone you, you t if you if you only trade equities um you'll find it look globally msci world whatever i mean um sure you can you know, take these indices apart break down that correlation structure but equities in and by itself will always or at least in person always have that like thing that drives them there's like this common tailwind um they are correlated and 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 the more stressful the markets are the more correlated they tend to become jerry and adam yeah. we'll start with jerry Markets you trade, how important is it? Um, what sort of markets are you trading? It's very important. 
<clears throat> to trade a good uh, all the markets. And I trade all the commodities except uh, a handful, like electric, like electric, electricity. Where it was mentioning no China commodities. I'd want to. I'd like to. I'm jealous that I don't. Um, <clears throat> all the bond markets. That, I mean, I can't imagine we don't trade all of them. And a few bond ETFs, corporate high, uh, junk, mortgage back tips. Um, and then uh, all the currencies, oh my gosh. Um, I'm always reading newsletters of other managers and I pick up one every now and then. I picked up one recently, I think it was, I can't remember, um, one of the pesos, but uh, always, uh, and then the crosses, you know, Swiss yen, sterling Swiss, all of those, so way too many uh, currencies. Um, and then half the portfolio, over 150 is stocks. A lot of stocks that are uh, correlated to currencies I mean, correlated commodities, the, some stocks that you cannot get the commodity exposure unless you use the stock, uh, coal, uranium, lithium, marijuana, and some others. Uh, Just U.S. stocks? No, it's uh, U.S., Canada, Aussie, Europe. Long and short, having shorts is a big deal. Uh, you get a lot more short exposure if you're trading the single stocks. These indices are pretty bad. Uh, they're bad in so many ways. I'm going to write a book about that before I write a book about the turtles. Uh, that's my contribution to mankind, <laughs> is to stay away from these stupid indices. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you tons of shorts. Um, and, uh, yeah, so you got to have longs and shorts, the indices right now. And, like, usually they're pretty correlated. Everybody's getting short. I've been short stocks varying degrees, you know, because... All these different stocks have different trends, just like they do on the upside. So uh, tr I, sometimes I think, what's more important, the system or the markets? You know, it's, 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 um, it's an unanswerable question because they're, they're both equally important. You make all this money because you get an outlier and you th thank you, outlier, thank you, sugar, cocoa, orange juice, <clears throat> yen. Yeah. You had nothing to do with it. You did a thousand trades just like those and those are the ones that made all the money. You know, how much credit do you really deserve, except for hanging in there with the loose pants and accepting the drawdowns? And uh, Eli Lilly, I posted that chart recently. It's like one of the greatest trends of all time. I mean, it's 600 ATRs, had a 50 ATR drawdown uh, in the middle. You gotta be strong, you gotta be tough. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry, with um, your selection of single stocks, are you, doing something to whittle down the broad universe of stocks first and then selecting from there two trade trend following strategies or is there trend following log logic involved at the outset in choosing what well, you're actually looking at a broad range of stocks and then filtering on trend? Yeah, I wouldn't choose any markers any time uh, based upon historical performance. Um, so it's based upon diversification, liquidity and because there's so many stocks, thousands, you know, you've got to have a method, and we tr we tend to trade the smaller ones, mid cap, uh, ten billion and below, uh, and um, and just try to build out a portfolio, a fixed universe of markets, stocks included, and trade those with the trend following, and not try not to get you know the CTAs get a little, I think they get a little intimidated by the stock market. They love the CME to hand them the, here are the futures to trade, ice here are the futures to trade, like. And so then they're like, okay, here's a thousand stocks. Oh my God, what, what should I do? I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm uh, flabbergasted. And I'm just like, look, choose your stocks, live with them. Uh, you're going to not, I didn't, I'm not long Eli Lilly. I just said I posted the chart. I didn't say I was long. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, uh, you know, and you just choose those and you try and follow them. And, and of course, um, you'll get your fair share of the outliers. So there's no magic to any of it except uh, doggedly consistency of um, choosing those markets, sticking with them, trading them all, not kicking them out, even when they don't do well, like Coco. Like uh, Maritz and I, I think we trade two Cocos. It's the worst market ever. So we doubled up on it. It's exactly the, ma that's the mentality you have to have. And Jerry, in your s selection of stocks, where, when you identify something and you think, oh, that's a unique one, I might be attracted to that. Mm -hmm. Are you getting away from these diversified companies and more to these companies with unique competencies in particular areas? How I mean, I think that's the theory. And it's not like such a big deal if it doesn't always work. Just be consistent with your choices and stick with them. 
that's the theory. It's a small company, maybe with uh, one fundamental uh, business line. Like so, eggs. Yeah, like eggs. We have an egg company, French fry company. Um, it's, it's really amazing uh, what you can get into. And then, uh, so that's what I tell people, like um, the smaller companies, you make it the bigger trends, the bigger outliers. Well, it makes sense to me because the more diversified company, you're getting more correlated companies if they're more diversified. So the ones with unique competencies, you're getting yeah. less correlated. But then Eli Lilly comes along with a $100 billion market cap and it goes, yeah. 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 So I also say to people, don't listen to me. You know, yeah. I mean, this is my theory. It's not going to harm me or, or hurt me because I'm just gonna to continue to do it and I'll get my fair share. I think the thing you don't wanna do is keep switching your idea back and forth. If you wanna trade the big ones, fine. Uh, if you wanna trade the smaller ones, that's probably gonna work out as well. You know, a lot of systematic traders, they're also discretionary traders because unless there is an overlord AI that designs your systems, at some point you will have designed your system, put it into action, that is the discretionary move, then it becomes systematic thereafter. Yes. But if you look at your system and you figure that you don't make money with cocoa and you therefore in an unsystematic way decide to remove cocoa from the portfolio because it's not making you money, that is actually not the right decision to take. You know, you need to be kind of like consistent in the market universe, the rules, the time frames, all these type of things and have the stamina to follow through with it. With it. If you, if, because the likelihood is you make the change at exactly the wrong point in time. Right? Yeah. You, will, you will remove cocoa because cocoa doesn't work. Mm. You've removed it and then it goes. <laughs> I mean, that's, what we, that's what we did with commodities. Commodities didn't work for a long time until 2020. Yeah. Adam, markets. Tell us about your markets, what your thoughts are, are about principles of diversification. Do you want to elaborate on that? Uh, well, we like all the major asset classes, equities, um, bonds, commodities and foreign exchange, but we stick solely to futures. And um, effectively, we add them in a, in a liquidity preference. So by turnover, and we start with the big ones, and then we, we keep adding, and then at some point we, we have a liquidity filter that says, unfortunately, we can't trade uh, this instrument. And so even if something looks good on a, a close-to-close -close basis, um, we don't want to be, um, you know, more than some ratio <laughs> of daily uh, liquidity or open interest so liquidity um, is important because you avoid things like massive gaps, those sort of things. Um, so it, it's helping to ensure that your losses are never too large. Well, I think there are some there are some contracts that just aren't really uh, aren't really liquid, and we, and we have a settlement price, um, but but there but there isn't necessarily a lot of um, a, a trading behind it, and that's something that we look to. Uh, to avoid because you don't want to be in a, involved in a situation where there's effectively no one uh, to sell or buy from when when entering or exiting a portfolio, and so that means that um, you know spreads effectively become a determinant of, of what we trade, and we're trying to minimise spreads. Yeah. Um, and and whilst we don't actually have a huge turnover, so spreads are relatively less important than somebody who's trading on a really short term basis. But why pay more? Uh, to, to, to get in and out of trades over time. While we're on you then, Adam, talking about which markets we trade, can we move into risk? What's, what's your view on risk management? How do you manage risk in your program? So we have, uh, you know, portfolio level risks, and then we have uh, individual trade risks. And at the portfolio level, we like to uh, allocate uh, a risk budget equally amongst our futures contracts. Um, but effectively, each sector, uh, you know, caps out at a certain uh, risk budget. And so um, at ECCM, the uh, equity index uh, budget is probably uh, relatively lower than, um, you know, the broader industry at around about 20%. And then financials are probably at around 20 to 25 percent, and then we would be overweight commodities, um, 
uh, at, at 40%. And we love uh, the dispersion that you're getting in the commodity space um, because while interest rates globally you know, can be linked, even though there are divergences in inflation rates and growth rates, um, you know, we also see a, a common S equity risk premium. And yeah. so if Japan is down, well, Wall Street uh, may or may not also be down, but quite often is. But in the commodity space, you're really looking at a, a sphere of instruments that are totally unrelated. You've got economic commodities, you've got agricultural commodities, and, um, and that's why we've overweighted those, and that suits, um, that suits our liquidity profile and also um, our, um, our appetite for um, you know, maximising diversity uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the portfolio. Okay. So, so overweight commodities, but you, you are spanning across the asset classes, but that you think your secret source is in the, the commodities to a degree in their, their trending nature? Well, I'll give you an example, OJ. So OJ, which has been a fantastic trade for 2023, in our portfolio, that's equally weighted with the S&P 500. And, and we can do that because of our size. And um, I think if you reach a certain size, it's impossible to weight orange juice equally to the S&P 500 without potentially distorting the OJ market. I think people would be loving to have an equal oh, well, weighting between yeah, I mean, OJ and the S&P 500 at the moment. Absolutely. I mean, you look at some of these commodities, I think like milk and butter, you just can't really get set. Uh, in these markets, and so we uh, don't really bother because you look at the spreads in the screen, and um, why pay away, um, you know, a point spread in that market when you can get get set in um, the 60 futures that we're in, you know, that we're comfortable in, that uh, there'll be someone there on the other side of the trade at the open, the close, and, and during the middle of the day. Yeah. Staying on risk, Moritz, you've said that risk isn't volatility, volatility isn't risk. Volatility is the standard measure of risk in finance and universities. Why isn't volatility equal to risk? Yeah, I think, um, or Moritz can chime in here as well. They're really different things to me. You know, sometimes jokingly, when you look at all the, just to give you an anecdote about the, the, the regulatory requirements that we have, you know, people kind of like demand that you need to have an independent risk function, like almost Chinese walled from the trading function. With our trading system, it just doesn't work like that. It's Regulators all, don't know best. It's, it's all an integrated thing. Like, you know, I cannot run that system without risk management being an integral part of it. Like it, it really, it starts at the very beginning with position sizing at the time of trade inception. This is this is when the risk management starts, right? And then we're keeping the loser small and uh, we have this diversified portfolio. If, if we had like an independent risk function at Takahe, these guys would be unemployed. There's nothing there for them to do. I mean, they could be calculating a value at risk, of course, or, you know, calculate realized volatility. And what we do with it, pretty much nothing. Um, because it's really, it doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, risk is, in our case, very much focused on not impairing and not losing too much of your core capital. We, we will be very, very tight with our own pocketbook um, when it comes to eating into our core equity. Um, if it doesn't work with whatever trend, we're no longer friends for the time being. We may be friends again you know, in a couple of weeks' time or maybe even tomorrow on a position reversal type of trade. We'll do it again, right? Nothing, no, no bad feelings, no harm's done. But not now. We're, we're, not, we're not allowing these, these losses to become too large. And then the volatility is just the, the result of essentially our trading strategy. You know, sometimes that volatility is a bit larger and sometimes the volatility is a little bit lower. We don't see any reason, um, Simon, to have a constant volatility target every day in a way where we'd say it has to be 10 on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, I don't really see why that's important to anyone. Uh, you know, it can be 12, it can be 15, it jumps to 18, it goes back to 15. That's just absolutely fine with me. Um, it is just that ride that we're going through. The daily vol is really not that important to me. It's something over time that I just completely um, started to discount 
Um, obviously, what does, you know, the, the entire thing changes when your drawdowns become too large. You know, when you go through these periods where you eat into your drawdown, 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 Yes, I mean you. Uh, this is this is when it starts to count. You know, are you <laughs> man up? Can you can you stick to the system? At what point uh, will you maybe not? But um, uh, you know, so far we've been very good with that. I think we've changed our psychology in a way that allows us to just do that. But I mean, from a we we are, we are talking about statistics a lot, right? So from a statistical point of view. The return distribution is classified by mean and volatility as distribution measures only for Gaussian, so normal distributions which are symmetric and do not have fat tails. So as soon as we kind of like trade as trend followers, we cut off the left tail and we focus on the right tail. So our distribution is by definition skewed and has a longer right tail. So using volatility as a measure of risk is by definition already wrong. Yeah. The other thing is it does not consider the position. So basically, if we focus on volatility only to, for example, steer position size, then, well, we might be short a market and we know that, for example, equity markets are um, correlated with volatility. So in a downward market, volatility spike up. But it's good for us. If we are short that thing, we would actually reduce our position size if we base it on volatility as a measure because it's symmetric. So there are many <coughs> things by definition <laughs> dog has discovered the bird or oh. thing? <laughs> <laughs> Where it just doesn't, it, it do, doesn't make sense. From a statistical point of view, it doesn't make sense. And if, on the other hand, you kind of like, there are some people focusing very much then on tail events and saying, well, we use a tail measure instead of volatility. Well, you have three observations maybe for the tail of the distribution. So it's even getting worse at some point. These are some of the reasons why I would say volatility has always been an uh, interesting measure, but it's not a good measure for many reasons. I find it different when we're talking about volatility. I notice that we all love baseball. When we're talking about outliers and these, um, these significant tail events or these material trends, we always get our baseball bats up and talk about hitting the ball out of the park. So naturally, that's going to in incorporate volatility into our models. But it's a good thing because we're dealing with beneficial volatility here. And I think that measures such as sharp ratio, standard deviation, they, they are uh, penalizing the beneficial volatility, which we are beneficially gaining from. And so when we're looking at the performance, you see, he also agrees, the dog. We don't shy away from beneficial volatility. We actually embrace beneficial volatility, uh, which is contrary to um, other types of trend following uh, that we often see where they are not letting their profits run. So our principle of the outlier is that we can't predict these things in advance and the market delivers these outliers. So we ride these outliers with these non-predictive models and we are not making any preemptive assumption about when those trends are going to end. And we simply, with our baseball bats, hit them out of the park. When, we're, when, when we are in tune with the market, we naturally um, hit them out of the park, not through our own skill, but just through we're applying this, this golden rule process. And um, so, yeah, I, I think that there are trend followers like us that focus on um, the delivery of upside beneficial volatility. And there are other forms of trend followers who are targeting different forms of trend. So I, I think you're right, Moritz, in that um, we are targeting the tails of the distribution, the trends found in the tails of the distribution, which inherently makes our, our method um, really appropriate for very uncertain volatile times because we cut losses short. We never let um, the left tail event in our trade distribution impact us, but we fully um, beneficially exploit any upside volatility in the markets. So speaking about things that the regulators and the textbooks might get wrong, Adam, what do you think the industry gets wrong at the moment? So in my humble opinion, um, you know, a, a, as a group, um, as a group and, um, you know, not referring to anyone necessarily seated here, but um, overweight financials, I think the portfolios are slated, uh, are slated to be overweight financials and underweight commodities. And um, so we, 
we are uh, relatively overweight commodities and we are relatively underweight financials and and we're able to do that because of our boutique uh, size so I understand that some of this is a liquidity constraint and that effectively the larger funds can't uh, access commodities in the same uh, size and quantum as uh, relatively smaller funds and so if I had to point to one thing I would say um, yeah, the, the underweight in commodities broadly yes. for our competitors. Um, right. Lisa, just grace us with your presence if you like. Lisa, just come through and put the bird on Jerry's shoulder. Lisa, the, the bird that uh, discovered us today, you've uh, made friends with. We know Jerry loves birds, so we, we had this little fella just fly in. So are your birds at home going to be jealous, Jerry, oh. when they see this? They'll never see this recording. They will never watch this podcast. <laughs> I'm such a disloyal person right now. <laughs> it's Petey, isn't it, at Petey. home? Petey. Oh. It's Petey. all CGI. It's not really happening. <laughs> this isn't real. Jerry, what are the most important elements of a trend-following strategy? Oh, wow. <clears throat> Certainly uh, diversification nothing more important. It's equally as important as a good strategy that doesn't have too many um, parameters. Um, and um, taking the small losses, which I don't think is a problem for most people. Putting the trade on is kind of a problem. Uh, if you don't put the trade, every trade on that you should, you're going to miss some big trends. Um, I used to not do all the trades when I first started trading because it was mainly because I didn't want to take that loss. I anticipated I'm going to have to take a loss. I don't want to take a loss. Uh, but everyone gets wrong um, the, what the computer will tell you as it relates to how long you should hold on to a winning trade. We hate that. We hate to hold on to it so long. It's going to look foolish. We're going to give back too much. It's too volatile. It's dominating the portfolio. On and on. There's so many reasons that as humans we don't want to hang in there. And the computer basically says you can't really hang on to it too long. Um, so I think that's what the industry gets wrong, um, telling, ag agreeing with non-trend followers and systematic people that open trade volatility in a profit is problematic, but it's a sign, it's what you have to do to capture those really large trades. Uh, it's not a problem, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Um, so I think that's very important. No one's going to ever take CTA, sorry, sorry to offend all of y'all here, but uh, no one's ever going to take CTA seriously, and if they don't trade equities, not going to ever happen. Uh, you need to trade equities long and short, uh, get some commodity exposure from the equities, um, and take into consideration that you've got thousands of these things, that uh, if there was a thousand commodities, that would be 50% of my portfolio. If there was a thousand currencies, but there's not. There's thousands of stocks. They do add value. You can find them. You have to do some work. And um, then uh, make, it's going to make the trend following better and make CTAs more respected to be part of the dialogue of the most important markets that exist. It makes no sense. They're great and they make trend following better. So why trade hundreds of markets in a trend following strategy? Um, <clears throat> the small bet size that Rich coined uh, for me, um, very important, and you, you do have some uncorrelated situations. When all the bonds rallied in March, that's problematic. 20 to 20 some percent of your portfolio may be bonds. Okay, but when something falls out of the sky, like the Swiss franc or OJ, hopefully it won't, uh, it's isolated. And the more in the portfolio, the better. Uh, it's so important. Uh, the, you mentioned risk control earlier. You have this co competition between the risk control and one of the most important things in trend following is to do every trade, follow the system. How can I do, how can I do every trade, which is mandatory, uh, and yet have this risk control? And I think um, this is what you have to overcome and conquer. And adding all of these markets, adding stocks, adding, it allows you to do all these trades because you're trading small and you're not putting into your system um, rules that smooth out the performance because 
You don't want to have very many rules. So the best way to smooth out the performance without corrupting your systems is to trade more and more markets, have more and more. It's not like we don't care about volatility. Uh, we care, we're just not willing to do everything that others might do that's going to make the systems and the performance less robust and worse. So the way to overcome that for trend followers is to just continue to add more and more markets and uh, trade the shorts. And uh, so when we do have this volatility uh, in certain trades, the rest of the portfolio will sort of have a good chance of balancing it out. This might show my ignorance, but when you've got so many markets to select from um, and you have you, you're allocating this huge pool of, of trades, like can you get to a point where you can't take another trade? How do you, do you then have to rank candidates to take that next trade or do you, do you make it uh, such that you can always take another trade? Yeah, you want to make, you want to set it up to where you can always do the next trade. So you have your risk budget, you divide that by the number of markets and that's your risk per market and it's um, it's very key to set up your approach to where you can do all the trades. You never want to be picking and choosing or having uh, some sort of risk management overlay that um, doesn't take trades, gets out of trades quicker. You only want to do these system trades. Um, so yeah, it's very important to always be able to do the next trade in the same way. Uh, this is to take advantage of um, the sample size approach where you actually are going to do every entry and every exit the same way in every market for the rest of your life. You're never going to not do that. That's what we have to do. Adam, why should investors allocate more to trend following? Well, I mean, you know, fundamentally, it's a superior strategy to, uh, to being uh, passive long only uh, or even 60-40. So, uh, you know, if you're long uh, stocks, they will get chopped in half at some point uh, in the next decade, and that's been the historical um, the historical experience. And um, effectively, you can just earn more in trend following, and you can do it, um, you know, for a better risk-adjusted outcome. So not only can you make more nominally but you can actually do it with less risk. So why would you not want that uh, as the final result? And then if you have to have some um, allocation uh, to traditional or legacy uh, you know, markets, as, as we like to describe them, um, then you should be blending north of 30% trend into those portfolios in order to be able to get the diversification benefits and push out that efficient frontier um, and, and we found from our research that once you get 30% plus trend, you really do make a huge difference to the drawdowns and also the returns that you can get out of your portfolio. Either of you guys, what's the right uh, allocation to trend following? Hey, can I answer Moritz? That? You know my answer. <laughs> 100%. 100%. Uh, Jerry? Oh, it's definitely 100%. I mean, um, how much of your wealth that you've worked hard to create do you want to not have a stop loss and not have a trailing stop? Um, how much bonds do you want to have long in 2022? You know, I mean, zero. You want to be profiting from those bonds. Look, you're going to have uh, people with emotions who are FOMO when it comes to the S&P and stocks who are really missing out. They don't understand trend. I get that. Um, but. I would say that the optimal portfolio would be about 80% at least, historically speaking. Probably in the future it's going to be closer to 100% trend. But you could probably squeeze in 20% long only, given the, how well the stocks have done recently. But that'll change as well. They'll have another lost decade where 100% trend following will be uh, mathematically and back testing will, will, will be the answer. But um, look, you're going to have these V bottoms and these V tops that trend following is going to fail. It's going to get short at the wrong time and not get long again, like we've seen in COVID, for instance, for a while. Um, and so that's going to be the evidence that, oh, for this part of the portfolio, I don't, it's okay if I lose half of it. That's never okay with me. You know? So I don't care what the past looks like. Um, I'm not going to 
trade any of the markets. Uh, every market that, that Long only could possibly have is in my portfolio with more diversification, more stocks, more bonds. Um, but I'm not willing to let any of it go in half. That's crazy. So why is it that long-term trend following works so well? I think it works well because it's hard to do. Um, it's counterintuitive. No one likes to take losses. Um, people crave positive feedback. I remember Rich used to say, just a one tick profit. Just a one tick profit. That's all I care, that's all I want. And that's why you see a lot of people will say, oh yeah, you move your stop up to break even. It, no, who thinks like this? Your, your attitude is, what does the computer say? Does the computer say it's gonna be better if I move my stop up to break even? No, it doesn't. It says you should take that full loss all the time. So uh, it's counterintuitive. It, it's, um, no one wants to hold on to this. As I said earlier, no one likes holding on to these long profits. Um, if you tell people, if uh, with this particular system, one entry, one exit, a stop loss, if I can assure you that over a 10 or 20 year period, this is what's gonna make the most amount of money for you, will you do it? Everyone will say yes. And then when it gets to uh, the daily battle and they see this one current trade, that they had a lot of profit in and start to go away, they're not, they're, they're gonna be overly tempted to book that profit. It's not working, I need to add some discretion. And so it's, it's uh, doing the hard thing uh, is usually a pretty good idea when it comes to uh, trading. And I think that's what trend following is all about. I love the um, integration here. We're talking about psychology now as quantitative traders. So uh, all of these human behavioral biases and our psychological makeup that we're analyzing that also plays a part in what we're doing. It's part of the whole game. So Moritz, what's your um, take on the interaction between the psychology and the kind of trading that you do? Yeah, in, in, in trading and in life, by the way, you know, you have some trend following rules in life as well. Um, Give an example, like um, this week, it felt like, oh, look at the interest rates. You know, I immediately need to reduce the short position on the bonds I have because you've seen that short squeeze. It's done. CPI number came in way below expectation. Uh, the Fed has overhiked. Um, there's a recession coming. Get out. <laughs> well, who knows, right? Mm. Um, you could listen to another economist saying, oh, you know, inflation is way stickier. It takes a long time to weed out. There's still funflation going on with Tyler Swift and all the money that's being paid for tickets. <laughs> the economy is booming. There is no big unemployment. So therefore, the Fed's likely going to just stay where it is or even go higher. And it's like, look, I have absolutely not enough qualification um, to opine on that. And I think forecasting or predicting anything around this is really foolish, at least for me. So the computer, like Jerry says, the research says, you keep your position exactly as it is right now. That's it. And this is the tough thing to do because as a human being, you look at these charts, um, the bonds, uh, the, some of the commodities, and, uh, or Eli Lilly. I didn't look at the chart yet, but probably just by visualizing that thing, you would go like, it's gone too far. It has simply gone too far. It needs to stop. And you would have said this, with OJ when it traded at 250, right? It went from 120 to 250, it has more than doubled. You look at the chart and as a human being, you think it now needs to mean revert. It has to go the other way. It's become too expensive. So we're keeping these positions, I've said this before, way beyond the point where most human beings would feel comfortable holding them. And there's no guarantee that it then continues going. But OJ, you know, went to, I think, 400 or close to 400, something like that from 250, where a lot of people would probably have taken profits. And that is really the tough part. You need to be able to follow through with these trades, not play around with them. Mm. You have no business um, to really interfere with, um, with that position, in mm. my opinion. And um, this is the tough part. You have to be willing to be wrong more often than you're right. People hate that, right? I mean, who likes to be a loser? You have to be a very professional loser. Like, you know, with elegance and style, you leave that tennis court, you've just lost the match. It doesn't matter. We're playing again. Uh, here's another surf. Maybe it's going to be an ace and we'll hit it out of the park to use Rich's uh, words.
Actually, interestingly, um, Adam, I believe you've, you've majored in psychology. So uh, in relation to trading a classic trend following way, why do you think it's so successful in relation to how it, 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 it deals with the biases of our psychology? Um, uh, well, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question, and I think humans are probably wired to mean revert. Um, you know, I wake up today and I expect it to be like yesterday. And if it wasn't, I'd probably move somewhere where it was. Or at least we had a predictable seasons or, or, or some flow uh, and cyclicality. And so I think we crave stability as humans and, and, um, and markets, as we all know, can be chaotic. And that's where we, um, that's where we shine as an industry. Uh, because we can take that chaotic period and we can exploit it and profit from it. Um, and that's the beauty of trend following. Mm. What markets are going to trend next year, Adam? Well, um, <laughs> yeah, trick question, <laughs> trick question. I mean, and that's the point. We're not making predictions. So I think we've all got open positions right now. And we might say, um, we can't even say that those markets will, will predict in 2024. Um, but um, it's assured that if a trend did emerge um, and, and continue, we would all be on it in some form, in some way, we would participate. That, that's a good thing about our process. It, like, it's non-predictive, yet we've got a process diversified across so many markets that if there are any trends, material trends in those markets, our process naturally gets us on board without us having to worry about, oh, what's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen next week? The process deals with all of that. No, absolutely. And... Um so, you know, 2024, I think we've had three or four years of super trend. And um, that's actually not to say that next year or, or the year after has to in some way mean revert. I think we've banked those trends and we just wait to see what, uh, what super trends, um, you know, uh, are in store for us for the future. Well, Jerry, over to that, you've been in the game for many, many years now and you, you've there were very strong trend-following returns from, say, nine, 1980 through to 2000s. And then th there have been sort of these periods where there might have been sort of stagnation over a period of time or whatever. So in general, could, could for instance, the period post-GFC up to 2020 where trend followers did, you know, that you know, a lot of people refer to that being the lost decade for the trend followers. I, I often dispute that because it's actually not a decade. It might have been three or four years, depending on what your strategy was. But if that is the anomaly, over the course of your career in trend following, has there been this consistent level of returns? Oh, definitely. Um, <clears throat> I think um, the, the usual pattern of returns is that uh, the diversified systematic trend following makes more than the S&P and has lower drawdowns. And so it was a big anomaly when that doesn't occur. And we have all the different markets, uh, longs and shorts, and so we should have a tremendous advantage, and we usually do. I think uh, maybe it could have been improved upon by having more equities in the portfolio um, and m m less indices because um, we're trying to, in a period where stocks were in a big trend and there was no lost decade for the equity people, I think uh, we need to ask ourselves, how did we miss that? Good point. And mm. being in these, another problem with these indices, of course, is the lack of outliers, the, out, the cap weighting. We don't size them the way we want to. Yeah. We don't um, get there's, the There's not outliers. a committee creating an index for us to trade. There's a decision Yep. Um, using a process to trend follow on equity, yep. Yep. long or short. Mm. We've spoken obviously about the glory of trend following and the merits thereof, but uh, Jerry, what are some of the weaknesses? What are some of the limitations of trend following? Uh, well, certainly we need the clients to be disciplined and in love with trend following like we are. That's a very difficult 
for them to do that. They do have the FOMO with the stock market, um, especially recently. I think that would all change. The few down years and a few great years for CTAs, people are weak and they will um, automatically, miraculously get religion and become eloquent spokespeople for trend following. Um, but like I said earlier, the V tops and the V bottoms where we're not great uh, all the time of protecting um, the equities with the crisis alpha idea. Uh, as flawed as it is, it do, we do have a tendency to help out a bit if, eventually in, in those. But, but there, there is trend following fail. And like I said, it's, for us, it's, uh, a lot of it is about psychology. It works for us because we're doing hard trades. So then you ask clients to merrily go along with all of that. Aren't you enjoying yourself? They're like, no, I'm not enjoying myself at all. Um, all my neighbors have long S&P and bonds, and when we all lose money, I feel okay. But I, my little small allocation to CTAs makes me feel horrible because it's not doing well. So, um, but yeah, trend following definitely has its issues. It's, it's a very, um, Good for us to mention them and remind us, ourselves, and our clients of those issues and not shy away from them at all because uh, there's so many positives that we can bring out. It's only fair we, we volunteer the, the negatives. Is part of the ongoing research, because you guys are all involved in this ongoing research effort, and you are all trying to constantly improve yourselves and your approach. Um, are there are there enhancements yet to be made? Like, what is how do the how do the limitations, the weaknesses, or, or the poorer periods factor into how you decide what you're going to do next year? If I could ask, maybe one of you guys. That question, how does the research process evolve your trading? Um, look, it's probably, I'm not sure, bad marketing, but um, we're doing a lot of research. That's the good marketing. But not a lot of the research that we do actually makes it into the portfolio. Maybe that is also a good story. So we're very selective about making any changes. And in fact, we very rarely do make changes. Um, we do trade spreads based on trend following principles. We like strategies that give us an amplified exposure to a possible outlier trade. We do that through options. We have not found in a very, very long time any reason to change the core engine of our single market trend following system. Um, you do analyze different time frames. You analyze different entry and exit techniques. We're using breakouts, for example. There's other ways to do that. Over longer, I say, periods of time, they kind of produce the same results. Breakouts is to us a more raw and pure form of trend following because it only uses price as the input. A moving average is a derivative of price. You already have a smoothing effect there. These are the nuances. Um, so it is um, the research tells us to add more markets. We like doing that. That's actually very enjoyable. Um, we look at different time frames. Uh, you will find that there is a an area or like a plateau where things tend to work. Um, don't be too specific about that. Um, trade around that level. Uh, it has become longer term. The shorter term stuff is too expensive to trade. Another you know, Jerry has mentioned he's going to write the book on the equity indices and the single stocks. We will. We should be. We should be writing a book about about the the vol controlling and all that because I, I honestly I think like we can we often speak about this but I think it's also an industry thing that has happened like um, CTAs didn't start out I mean Jerry can confirm that with a vol controlling engine running in their background uh, probably um, Rich and, and and Bill didn't think about that or it wasn't even known back then I don't know but. The industry has grown. Um, a lot of these shops have become institutional. Um, you know the names, the big, you know, call it managed futures, trend following CTA trading firms. And kind of like as a response function to client demands, they have probably integrated these um, smoothing, risk controlling type of overlays. Um, 
when you think about it, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, uh, everybody was fine with the S&P 500 and equities in general to, to be producing 20% vol. It was 20% vol and sometimes a bit more and no big deal. And then, oh my goodness, uh, you know, in the period between 2000 and 2010, something changed. 20 vol was no longer good. It had to be 10 or single digit, right? And then there's this response function to lower interest rates and maybe higher market volatilities. More money comes into the CTAs. You then combine a trading question, like you yourself as a trader, you sit back and say, for my money, for my investors' money, I want to produce the best returns, the best risk-adjusted returns. I just want to be a good trader. Once you get your business to, say, 5 billion, 10 billion, 30 billion, different different thoughts might enter your head. It's like, oh, well, that is a lot of money, right? Um, Adam has mentioned the orange juice. What role can orange juice play in the portfolio? Very little, nothing, right? It doesn't move the needle anymore. So you think about it more from a business perspective. Maybe if you want to go down that way, you lower the volatility. The lower your volatility, the less contracts you need to trade, the more money you can manage, the more you can emphasize the management fee and be that asset gathering business. You create the narrative around it and the vol controlling and all that type of stuff keeps the client happier. You reduce the volatility of your asset flows because you're not giving them the big ups and the big downs. We need the big ups. You know, we have our trade distribution already configured in such way that the left tail is, well, it's not going to be a fat tail, right? It's, it's essentially cut off. The right tail, that's where the volatility goes. If we have an outlier trade, it is by definition going to be a positive event, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. we really like that. And so we, this, is, this is the thing where I really, um, I, I, I rub my elbows with, and we have the data to also show it is, this interference, this constant almost or daily interference with your position size based, based on volatility or even portfolio correlation, it is not free of charge. That is not just something that falls from the skies and is, is, is free for you to consume. It does have trading costs. You do pay bid offer. And you do have that function of like correlation and volatility with respect to your asset price movement at that point in time. And we think that what you're actually doing is you're executing a hidden mean reverting trade, a hidden profit um, early exit, like profit taking trade, which is <laughs> the opposite of what we should be doing in trend following. And it kind of like moves into the portfolio. Um, so you're adding a mean reversion type of thing to the trend following. Yes, it makes it smoother, but I don't think it makes it better. If anything, it makes it more fragile and less robust. Mm. Jerry, we, uh, do you want to make any comments about um, correlation management, dynamic position sizing, volatility targeting in relation to um, how it compromises our process? Sure. I mean, it definitely compromises it from the sample size point of view, counting the, the trades. You know, um, we've mentioned that before. Um, oh, and another thing, too, you know, when you... Um, you have to trade larger. You know, this risk goes somewhere. So you have to take a larger losses. It, the, the portfolio is theoretically more efficient. That's no problem. My sharp is higher. Of course, I'll leverage it up. Of course, I have no trouble taking bigger positions because um, I'm, not, I'm not holding onto those outliers as long. So they're really leveraging up a very wobbly platform where the robustness is lower, the parameters are greater, uh, we're going to have to trade larger because you're making 100 ATRs on your OJ. We're making 25 or 50. But we got out, and we didn't have the big drawdown. And so it's just a house of cards, in my opinion. So I really think that um, uh, when Moritz was speaking, I was thinking, yeah, it needs to be these boutique firms that can um, trade the core classic trend because they don't have anything to lose. They don't. They can be... Uh, by standing still and not evolving, we've become uh, the ones who are really changing and uh, with the new ideas. Because uh, just standing still, I've become very unique in my field. Bucking the trend. Yeah. Uh, um, I can't think of the word I'm trying to come up with. Uh, but, nimble. <laughs> um, yeah. But, and, and we can have the commodities be a big portion You're of what we Cutting edge by standing still. Yeah. We're cutting, yeah, we're, 
we're re evolving by doing nothing and watching uh, the, the industry go away into this asset gathering, money management fee. But I totally might disagree a bit with what Moritz said. If you put these guys, no offense, Moritz, number one or two, whichever one you are, uh, if you put a, these group of PhDs in a room and you said to them, here's a billion dollars to manage, um, you don't have to all manage and correlation manage, they would say, oh no, no. I've talked about how it's the client's fault and the clients love it. I'm trying to take care of the clients, but I love it. They love it. That's what they want to do. It's their bring, upbringing, it's the normal distribution upbringing that they've had in these universities that you talk about. Um, yeah, no. Um, they don't want to get rid of this vol management, correlation management, regardless of what clients say. And it's a shame because there's so much to be um, offered by the trend following strategy and playing on those tails and letting those profits run. Um, so much a better product and a safer product. I think what makes us all actually really unique as traders is that we're managing our own money we're entrepreneurs, we want to build our own wealth. And, uh, and so the first priority is not really the client in that sense that uh, we want to do the right thing by our client by doing what we really believe in, not what the industry promotes or... Um... Well, they're supposedly paying us fees for our expertise and then we're bucking to their demands. We shouldn't be doing it that way. We should be offering our expertise and giving them the best mm -hmm. Um, you know, a risk-adjusted return over the long term because we know how to deliver that. Yeah. It's, um, like, it's like going to your doctor and saying, and the doctor says, you need to lose 50 pounds. And, but, I, but you can keep eating your sweets, yes. your sodas, and just keep going, you know? I mean, whatever, just pay me my doctor fee. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Uh, we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be giving, uh, making people eat their broccoli. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, we're all heavily invested, and you guys are heavily invested in your own funds, there's skin in the game. I think that changes everything. Um, we were talking earlier down on the deck about how much different that is to, um, to a game where you can play with somebody else's money, but um, you're working for an institution that you can walk away from if things go poorly. Uh, you don't want things to go poorly on your own money. So, so the skin in the game redefines everything, how you approach it, how you look at it, and, uh, and you want to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, because it's your money on the line. It's our money on the line, so we, want, we mm. know what we can deliver, mm. and we want that, and so we bring the clients on for that ride, um, as opposed to uh, appeasing their demands. We should, uh, we should wrap up because uh, the sun's coming in and we all are here in this beautiful spot to have a drink and, and, and eat and have a barbecue and, and uh, everyone else is inside so we'd love to get back to that. Let's wrap it up. If anyone wants to um, finish with something fun like a big mistake you've made and what you've learned from it, uh, please uh, chime in. Does anyone have something fun they want to end on? I can Adam. go first. I mean, not getting into trend following earlier. Uh huh. You know, so I think, I mean, we probably all tried different approaches. A mix of systematic, a mix of discretionary. And for me, it's just, you know, going 100% all in. And, and I have to say, ever since I've done it. Um, when, did you I, when did you get into it? What, what year, year sort of were you attracted into it? Well, I, I have to say, I started with the options and uh, fascinated with options trading and that, you know, if you're selling them, you, you want uh, mean reversion if, and if you're buying them, you want uh, dispersion. And um, so that's a, that's a particular mindset, um, you know, to, to adopt. And then over time, just gravitating to the power of futures and, um, and the ability to control risk and get, um, and get a certain return profile. Um, but yeah, 100% trend and um, not looking back. You guys, anything to offer there? Uh, Big mistake. Look, life is full of hopefully uh, small mistakes and never, never the big penalties. Um, sometimes your position size is, uh, you know, you didn't, Jerry was mentioning, you, did, you didn't take the trade. It's, it, but it hasn't happened to me in a long time, to be quite honest. But um, earlier on, like 
it's a journey, the entire thing. I, th I don't think anybody is born on like day one, it's like, oh, this is exactly how I tried for the rest of my life. Everybody is curious, everybody, you know, loves to be curious. You try things out, you play around with these rules, uh, with these markets, with different systems, different exits. You think that you have found something, more likely than not you've outsmarted yourself, but you can't resist, right? Um, you think that you are better than the computer by not taking that cocoa trade. Yes, um, we've all made our mistakes. There's not a single person that has. Trading mistakes are part of the thing. The, the, the key thing is that over time you stop making these mistakes. It's a learning process. You take that feedback. Don't overthink it. Just take that trade. Um, so hopefully for all traders the mistakes are small. Mm. You file them. Uh, you learn from them. And you absolutely do want to avoid the large mistakes because they can be paralyzing and mm. career ending. So that is that is part of that. Cons it's consistency, right? Part Just of trading your own money and yeah. being being conservative. Jerry? I like all these things that they've said. I think uh, trading small, you know, don't use too much leverage. Um, Any big mistakes lurking in your past you can uh, I've made, share? I've made them all, yeah. But they all revolve around trading too large. Yep and not following the system. But early on, um, just in you know, January 1984, you know, I just wasn't picking the phone up and doing all the trades. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just that basic of a mistake, you know. Um, Rich called us on the phone after like a week or two of trading and all the phones were ringing around the office and picked the phone up. He goes, how do you think he did? And I said, I think I did okay. He goes, how many trades did you do? I said, like maybe 10. He goes, how many do you think you should have done? I said, I probably 25. He goes, yeah, you should have done 25. <laughs> <laughs> so, what a lovely blank though. No, no, I mean, it, it was such like, he wasn't mad. He was just trying to help me, coach me, be nice. And I'm like, yeah, I gotta do more trades. So you just gotta do the trade, do it, and uh, follow your rules. Um, and thankfully, I never had a period where I was rewarded for not doing the system. Like I always lost money. So I didn't have a good period where I got out of a trade quick. Whenever I got out of a trade too, too quick, it kept going up. So I'm thankful for that. Guys, thanks for coming and talking classic trend following in Sydney. Thanks, Adam, for sharing your beautiful office space. We're very much enjoying it. Um, hope you guys enjoyed the, the plane trip in. It's a nice view from the earth, from the, from the earth, from the air. Sydney, Sydney Harbour. It's a nice day for it. What's not to like? Um, so thanks again. Is there anything else to add, or do we do we wrap it up? Well, thank you. Is thank um, you, Simon. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and thank you, Rich. Thanks. Thanks for organising as well. We should remind you that the conversations on this show are informal and for entertainment purposes only. Certainly any general advice you may hear is obviously not specific to your needs, goals or objectives. So nothing discussed on the show should be considered as investment advice. If you want that, you'll need to actually do your own research and speak with your financial advisor. Remember, trading can be extremely risky and past performance is not necessarily indicative of future returns. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe or leave us a review. And if you have any questions or feedback, we'd love to hear from you. Bye for now.